Good morning ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's webinar entitled Design Methods Working from Personal Fascination. I'm Yeti van der Made Hanning, the founding director of CCDNL. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Ms. Nikki Wester. Nikki is a designer and future heritage specialist and today she's going to share how she gets inspirations for her designs. Today's webinar is the second lecture from three lectures on Tenun Ikat and Tete Indonesia connecting to the Netherlands. In today's webinar, the CCDNL finally materialized the cooperation with the Wasserai Rotterdam after a few failed attempts due to the corona restrictions. Thank you. 
morning ladies and gentlemen welcome to today's webinar entitled design methods working from personal fascination i'm yeti van der made hanning the founding director of ccdnl i'm pleased to introduce today's speaker miss nikki wester nikki is a designer and future heritage specialist and today she's going to share how she gets inspirations for her designs. Today's webinar is the second lecture from three lectures on Tenun Ikat and Tete Indonesia connecting to the Netherlands. In today's webinar, the CCDNL finally materialized the cooperation with the Wasserai Rotterdam after a few failed attempts due to the corona restrictions. The Wasserai is an incubator for innovative fashions in Rotterdam and in this collaboration, CCDNL and Nikki, as our lecturer today, have the opportunity to explore how the cooperation between Nikki and fellow designers at the Wasserai, Lara Lukman and Lidwe van Twillert, contributes to the efforts to improve the quality of the craft from design, also how they as a designers connected and inter interact with the Tenun Ikat artisans to share and transmit knowledge for mutual benefits while maintaining cultural integrity of the craft. The organizational aspect of how cooperation between CCDNL and the Wasserai meant for ICAT itself, from culture, history, design, product, and for the community, will be explored further. There are also representatives from three Tenun ICAT weaving groups in entity actively participated at today's webinar, and they are Silviana Boidao from Wehor Hadomi in Belu, Asmawet Fatu and Marsa Fatu from Rotendao, and Sherry Atole from Alor. They will share their efforts and struggles in preserving the craft and also during the pandemic. Well, we have a full house today. Uh, there are also beautiful dance performances, uh, event promotion, Q&A with Zooming after the webinar, so please stay until the end. So without any further ado, on behalf of the boards of our directors, volunteers, and interns, I wish you all a wonderful time joining today's webinar. Danke well, thank you, terima kasih. Hi, Ruth, uh, thank you so much for having us here. Yeah, also Esther, thank you. Uh, I'm good, thank you. Uh, just for the pandem pandemic, of course, it has been hard for many of us. Uh, we have to work from home. Uh, many of our appointments were cancelled. Me and Esther have uh, made appointments like uh, since uh, February, right? Yes. And we just managed to meet today. So this is also a cause of pandemic yeah. that our meetings are postponed or cancelled. But uh, we are fine and we are happy that we are here today again, right, Esther? Definitely. Um, yeah, uh, thank you uh, for, for uh, being here in uh, the Basserij in, in Rotterdam. And I'm really happy to finally meet Yeti in person because we talked a lot uh, over the phone in the last uh, month and over email. And um, yeah, we are also good uh, here uh, in the Basserij. We are a hub with a lot of uh, fashion entrepreneurs. Um, it's been uh, definitely a struggle uh, since, since March, since the, the lockdown. Uh, but what is really nice to see and what is also giving me a lot of hope is that uh, creatives are very um, uh, good in finding ways uh, to re re, uh, yeah, rebuild their business, rethink, um, yeah, find creative solutions to, to handle this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I look at that with a lot of admiration and respect. So uh, it also brings a lot of new ideas. I think that is good. As I said earlier, that uh, we were planning uh, to do a collaboration with our project that we're supposed to do with Indonesia, right? Yes. Uh, I don't know if you know that we are planning to go to Indonesia, in fact, last June with a team of uh, Dutch designers. Uh, 
that we wanted to collaborate with the Indonesian artisans, but due to Corona and uh, all the lockdown and the trip cancels the, the project also, we, we are not canceling it, but we postpone it. So uh, we see as a potential for us to work with because the Swasserai also one of their main, one of probably your main concern and focus in textile. And within this project of uh, binding with ICAD, we are working in textile and uh, also Swasserai is in uh, Rotterdam. And uh, we are also in Rotterdam and we are also trying to uh, promote uh, the, the city of Rotterdam through art and culture. Of course, we are not promoting the city of Rotterdam, but we promote our work, how to fit within uh, the framework of uh, Rotterdam city, and so that we see the potential to work with the Vassare, even though the project, physical project was postponed, mm -hmm. but we come online, and uh, for the moment, uh, yeah, we, we are trying to see how can we work with Vassare through the online with the new, new method of um, new, new normal, yeah, that what we say. Yeah, I think um, what is nice is that we are right now sitting in the space where we were supposed to do our physical collaboration. Uh, so, uh, yeah, as Yeti said, uh, we got in touch because um, uh, the Vassare uh, hosts a festival every year. Um, and this year it was supposed to happen in November and the, uh, the theme is hyper-local. Mm -hmm. And we are on the one hand looking around us here in Rotterdam about yeah, towards what material is being made in the city, uh, who are the makers, what are their strategies. And um, uh, I think in uh, looking towards the future of fashion, which is really the main objective of the Wasserij as a community, we really try to uh, gather around us a group of people that are uh, working uh, for a better, uh, towards a better future for fashion. Um, we always are looking uh, for solutions in innovation, but I truly, really believe that if we look at traditional textiles and um, yeah, the culture, the indigenous cultures, and the way they use textiles, there are so many ancient, old uh, solutions that. We, we now think are new, but they are a thousand years old. And uh, for the festival, I really wanted to collaborate with uh, Yeti. I would find it so lovely that people that are, for example, working on um, the science of uh, coloring textiles uh, with bacteria, it all sounds very futuristic. It would be lovely if they could see how natural dyes work, for example, uh, in Indonesia and see how that was in the past. And I think there are very interesting links to be, to be made. Uh, so now that we cannot do the physical collaboration, I think we are trying to connect our networks. Yes. And this is the start? Yes. Right? Yes. That's right. Yes. 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 I, I don't have a specific project in mind yet, but I think with these kind of collaborations, it definitely already starts with uh, people like Yeti and I uh, introducing people to each other that would never meet each other without our help. That is the start always of creative collaboration. And uh, what is nice is that we both represent this kind of network. Uh, I was part of your first webinar and I was so happy because I saw all these um, uh, craftspeople from, uh, from Indonesia working with ICAT. How would I ever meet these people? Yeah. So I thought, wow, I really want to connect them to the designers that have a studio in the Wasserij. And the beautiful thing about designers is that you don't have to tell them, please make this project, but you have to tell them, Please talk to this person, and then things sometimes uh, emerge that you would never, never expect. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that's what I'm hoping uh, this uh, experiment, could yeah. we call it, would uh, yeah, would result into. Yeah. I'm not so sure if there's actually a lot of differences, but mm -hmm. um, I think in our current context, when you look at fashion, uh, when you ask people what does fashion mean, they think about some kind of Western explanation of what fashion is. And maybe when they look at ECOT, they don't consider it fashion, but of course it is. Uh, so I think that's also something we can really learn from each other, that um, uh, fashion and traditional textiles are very um, uh, strongly connected to each other. It's where the original fashion comes from. Uh, and when you look very specifically at, at examples, for example, looking again at natural dyeing, mm. that is something that, I mean, that was not invented uh, yesterday. That is something that has been around for ages. Um, and I think young designers are trying to look again into those traditional te textile techniques.
uh, to me is uh, modern doesn't mean that always new. Okay. So modern means that, and the the title or the theme of this collaboration is uh, binding with ICAT for past and present and future. So that is why I, we see that uh, ICAP is uh, not only uh, working in the past, but it is also contextual to the present and also for the future. So uh, to like, collaborate with organizations like the Wasserie that uh, we focus on also with the experiment or new way of doing it, uh, ICAP fits very much with it. And if we want ICAP, to be uh, longer or to have value present in the future, then uh, we also have to look at those elements. How can we integrate those elements into ICAT without sacrificing the cultural integrity of ICAT? And that is also the main goal of our work, that uh, we want to bring ICAT into the level of present today, how can be meaningful today and for the future, but while uh, without we sacrificing the cultural integrity of ICAT. Mm -hmm. So I see uh, what is modern and it doesn't mean that uh, everything must be new. Be new right? yeah, exactly, and I think it's also, there are so many different aspects uh, around the topic of ICAT. Of course it's about the material and how it looks, but it's also about a certain kind of community. Yeah. And uh, that is not very common anymore in the um, modern fashion world. Yes. That uh, it's all about, especially in the Netherlands for the last 20 years, it's been all about ideas. Mm -hmm. Fashion is about ideas, but very few uh, fashion designers know how to make something. Mm -hmm. Whilst it is so important and um, um, designing and creating ideas from the material, uh, most of the time when people start learning that, they come to totally different uh, mm. solutions. So I think there is really um, where the interesting uh, crossover and uh, cross-inspiration might be. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I love this idea of community. I love yeah. that people um, form a community around a specific uh, skill. So uh, yeah. I would love to learn more about yeah. it as well. Yeah. And may I add a bit? Uh, because ICAP in Indonesia meaning tie and bind. So meaning that there is not being done alone. There yeah. should be exactly. a connection to another. And another thing also that ICAT in uh, entity, particularly in the region, it's function to wrap the body. So uh, this is also a function. Like blanket, yeah. Yeah. Not just blanket, but becoming a clothing. Yes. So in the different form, like like now, also fashion in Indonesia are also turn to ICAD, many young people, uh, young uh, designers or also senior designer, well experienced designer are very much to ICAD because uh, they see that this is a heritage that not only living in the past but also living in the yeah. today and uh, can be also uh, to, to preserve it for the future that we have to strengthen today mm -hmm. yeah, based on the past. Yeah. ICAD in the past function uh, basically uh, for status, social status, so only a certain group of people have a hierarchy, have lots of symbol and meaning, and one of it is also that uh, to honor your guests, uh, usually uh, we give ICAT. Mm -hmm. So let's say if you visit my place for the first time, we give an uh, ICAT or in collaboration and cooperation, we also give ICAT as a symbol of binding yeah, so ICAT itself meaning tie and binding and also that we, they also do it in the practical way or also in the social life every day. The ICAT, so ICAT is not only function as a cover of the body but also function in the social or rituals and also festive to, to welcome guests and all of so it's part of it. Yeah. So uh, this is the ICAT that coming from uh, Rote Island and it's interesting when today I came here, uh, a good friend of us, I uh, see is also a volunteer, she has been always helping us, drove me and she said that that is the uh, river of Rote and I said what? And I was like, I came in now uh, Rote Ica that huh? <laughs> I brought to the Wasserie. Oh, that's nice. So I was like, wow, what a coincidence. This is, this is the hotel? Yeah, so this is the ICAT from Rote Island. Oh, um, I see. Yes, so uh, we don't know still where it is 
the ideas are coming to this since when uh, a lot of uh, motives and variation but this ikat is part with the Rotanese people life for so many centuries uh, mm -hmm. even uh, you can't find a right source when was it and as the probably you could look at the symbols and the motives here you find cross you find candles mm -hmm. and uh, these are coming from the Netherlands ah. yes so before that the Rotanese ikat was predominantly with uh, leaves yeah you can also find leaves here Leaves are leaves are here. Yeah. Uh, also, basically showing about the nature. Mm -hmm. But the coming of the Dutch in the island, uh, the island of Rotterdam has a very strong history with the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. It started the connection with the Netherlands in 1600, and uh, for that, the influence of Dutch in uh, in Rotterdam Island is quite strong. Have a very strong history, and that is also you can see in Rika. The, so, how they implemented the uh, cross and candle and uh, Rote Island also uh, is the only island that uh, majority is Christian in Indonesia so uh, uh, having said that that uh, why I brought this textile uh, it's not just uh, uh, to so ikat, but somehow we wanted to reconnect with the past. Yeah. That how uh, the Dutch and the Indonesians, uh, the Rotanese, uh, implement their ideas or their history into this ikat. Mm -hmm. So this is what this ikat is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Since we are uh, not allowed to uh, come closer, we yes. have to respect the <laughs> rules. Uh, in Indonesia, usually we uh, the tradition is that we put the textile in your soja, but uh, this is the textile now, so feel wow. free to take it and uh, put Can it. I? Yes, uh, wow. that, is, uh, that is for us, uh, that is yours. <laughs> well, on behalf of uh, all the residents of the Vassar, yes. I thank you so much. It's extremely lovely, and I know yes. how nice it You did it my... so well, <laughs> you did it so well. Um, I know that there are um, there are a few uh, designers that are a little bit familiar with your work and with the cuts already. Yes. Uh, I think in the webinar that will uh, follow uh, our talk, yes. uh, there will be a meeting uh, with Laura Lufthom, yes. uh, who loves this, these textiles, but there yes. are more. And I hope that we can make some beautiful connections uh, in the future. Yeah, wonderful. And I want to add that also, yes. Esther, in the past, the cut from this island is very beautiful it was well made with a beautiful cotton or somehow with some little bit of silk and also with a very nice natural color mm -hmm. but however what you have now is not a natural color mm -hmm. so this is also the message that we wanted to bring into that how can we help this tradition back to the past that yeah. was so powerful, so beautiful, so with high quality mm -hmm. and very much concerned about the environment yeah. and nature and uh, so we give you the whole package, the, the <laughs> present yeah. and also the message that how can we work together to help uh, the community to get back to the what, what was precious in the past. Yes, yeah. thank, okay. you. thank you, <laughs> it's, it's, it's extremely lovely. And uh, I will wear it with pride. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep it with pride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so oh. the, the first uh, talk will be between uh, Laura Luchtman, uh, who's part of the Living Color Collective, and Nikki Wester, who's working yeah. with you. And I think that the talk will be joined uh, by people from your uh, community, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And ours, of course. Yes. So hopefully, a lot of meetings yeah. and a lot of connections will be made. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>Different from the previous webinar will be the number of interviews in this edition. You will hear about various design methods, firstly, by a general overview of the most common approaches, 
but secondly, through talks with Indonesian artisans involved with the CCDNL uh, community, as well as designers active at the Wasserij. I hope to give you an overview of conventional creational methods to provide inspiration, of course, as well as a platform of knowledge and expertise exchanged within this CCDNL community, but of course also with all others who watch this webinar. Here another designer for this webinar, this time Liedewij van Twillert. Uh, she's also a designer working from the Wasserij in Rotterdam, the partner that Yeti just introduced. Um, Liedewij, you are, you call yourself a fashion design engineer and you are owner of Ari van Twillert, a uh, lingerie and jewelry label. Can you give a short introduction on yourself and what you do with your, lady, uh, with your label, Ari van Twillert? Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Um, with Ari van Twillert, I try to create products and garments that people will cherish, so they will take better care of it and they will last longer. Um, I do this by uh, adding value with adding stories to the design. So there's a story behind every design and also all designs can be personalized to you. So custom fit, but also uh, custom aesthetics. Um, in that way, I want to create a stronger connection between the garment and its wearer. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's the goal of what I do with Ari van Twillert. Okay, um, this webinar is especially about the designing technique and as discussed with Esther, we made a selection of people who have a different approach to design and to creating design. And one of the reasons uh, we, we invited you and I'm interviewing you is because you've got a very special approach technologically wise and science wise. Can you explain us more about your creative and creation process during working? Uh, yes, uh, my background is actually not in fashion, but in engineering. So an uh, industrial design engineer uh, was trained at um, and that's that's like immediately I'm I'm turned on when I uh, when something involving science or technology is on my path and uh, while designing I want yeah I, I first create a, a frame for myself framework for myself uh, to work within and that framework is mostly based on science and technology so that's the start of when I yeah when I design. Okay, and this, this framework, uh, can you explain this further? How you, um, is this a boundary you have to create yourself? Uh, otherwise you get lost? Or is this a boundary you get from clients? Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, uh, is the start of my process. And mostly I created actually myself. Um, it, it comes naturally actually, because it, when I have found the inspiration is the framework actually. So if, if science has, is like really uh, one and one is two. So that's a really yeah, clear framework in that sense. Um, but that actually inspires me to, to ex like explore the boundaries of that framework. Okay, clear. Uh, an important part of the CCDNL society, uh, I told you already, is the ikat weaving and also a big part of it is natural dyes. So I'd like to ask some questions about the color choices you do during your work. Color also plays an important role in your work. Um, can you tell us more about how you choose colors or how you define the color choices for your designs? Yes, um, well, I'm, I'm mostly uh, it, it starts with intuition, really. Um, and uh, for my water drift collection, I used uh, graphs of uh, water levels. And these, actually, the, one of the graphs already had, had a really interesting color palette, which was just total random. Because a scientist is not like picking colors with, oh, this looks nice together. So, but these kind of contrasting colors, I kind of, 
I, I chose the best tones of each college in that sense. And then that was actually working so well already. Uh, that's, uh, that was just like an easy choice to say. Um, <clears throat> but for my new collection, I kind of had some trouble defining the colors because uh, I work with a singer and she also had uh, preferences, of course. Um, and I mostly work with very bright colors, but this time she, she kind of didn't really like it. And the start for uh, my uh, color palette was actually the, the living color project of uh, Laura and Ilfa, uh, because I really liked that purplish uh, color. So that was the start and that's already a bit pastel. So to, but yeah, because that was the start of the pro, uh, color palettes, I kind of had some trouble to make it like spark actually. So, um, yeah, but I finally now I, I succeeded, I think, but it uh, was more of a challenge than the other. They, they just came naturally. And how did you find the, the spark uh, color? Was it just um, experimenting or? Yeah, just uh, uh, laying these uh, different tones together. Um, and actually I added uh, white to the purple palette uh, because that, yeah, that's, that's giving that um, more fierce, fierce look. And I also have a kind of peach palette and there I added black. And that was <laughs> because I was like, should I add another like super bright color, but um, that's really, then it would become a um, circus. <laughs> so uh, that's, I think uh, I'm now uh, really happy with the colors. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, I'm also really curious what I will make with it actually. So we'll see. <laughs> okay, clear. So use of more contrast. Uh, I wanna go back to your previous uh, um, part. You call yourself a fashion design engineer. Um, can you, try to define what makes your approach and your design approach unique uh, in comparison to other designers? Um, yes, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not super familiar with other people's design process. <clears throat> um, but I think, yeah, starting with a, uh, yeah, with a, uh, straight away visualization of yeah i'm not sure actually mm. what inspires you most about working with technology and science well um it's just an immediate reaction in my head that goes off when i see some like if when the, with the water drift collection it was re really clear we uh it was actually a project called task force fashion which um, brought all these designers together uh, to, to yeah, tackle a, a societal problem. And that was the rising sea levels. So it's kind of super far apart fashion and rising sea levels. But um, we had two kind of workshops or lectures. First one was at um, the water management um, office um, and there they explained how they manage all the water in the Netherlands because we're really below sea level. So there's lots of water pump stations that keep our feet dry. And then when they're, they will, they, he, he did a game where, he, where we simulated um, like over flooding almost. So you had to really manage and work together with all the stations to, to keep the feet dry. And there were all these uh, formulas and graphs uh, coming along and my head was immediately turned on by that. Um, yeah, I was just so like hyper on, on, on energy. Uh, yeah, just, I really find it fascinating because there were really odd graphs as well. I didn't, I didn't really see these kind of graphs before. So it was really inspiring to me. It's also a really, maybe a literally, literal trans translation of the t technology to the lingerie, but I don't, I, I like straightforwardness actually. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure how other people get in, get their inspiration, but this is, I think how I get mine. Okay. 
Um, you just uh, told us you start with a framework, with the design framework. Uh, do you start your designs by drawing or is it immediately digitalized because you, um, you say technology plays an important role? Can you tell us more about the design process from idea to uh, finalized design? Yes, um, well, I do some doodling, but it really doesn't look anything like anything serious uh, yet. But, uh, so I, I go straight, yeah. Pretty fast uh, go to uh, Illustrator to design my uh, uh, work uh, because it really works really quickly for me and I like uh, geometric um, clear lines in my work so uh, doesn't really need any acro kind of sketching methods anyways I really like it to be um, yeah, super clear lines uh, high contrast so that works really well in uh, Illustrator and um, because the, the technology sometimes is also digital so you can immediately translate it instead of like drawing something that, yeah. So it works really well for me. And then um, I do some material research where I yeah, try to, to visualize what I have in my head in reality. Um, and then um, then I start uh, yeah, implementing it in actual garments. And so I first the make product, a test model yeah. for fits and then the real thing. So the products that you design are almost always uh, tangible in comparison to your designs, which are completely digital. Uh, yeah, so my design method is pretty digital in, indeed. And then, uh, but I do, like I can, I'm now working on this new project and I, I make some pa paper prototypes, for example, where I line all the, this, this is the sound wave of the singer I'm working with. And this is then um, a material sample I created. So also with her sound wave and it's three layers of tool embroidered together and then cut away where I don't, yeah. So you get this, um, really uh, gradient kind of idea. <clears throat> so this is already pretty tang tangible, I guess. Um, do you notice a difference in your designing methods when you work for self-initiated projects in comparison to projects you do for clients? Um, well, I, uh, the projects I do for clients are more if I make a custom fit bra for them, for example, and then it's really just kind of copying the design I made before to their measurements. So that's not, for me, that's not really uh, the most fun thing to do, to be honest. It's just like uh, repeating what I've done before, but then to a different size. So that, that's, that's what I mostly do for clients. Um, but uh, when I start a new, new project, new collection, then, then I can just let my mind be free and that's what I love to do the most. So that, that's actually the difference, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you developed quite an interesting approach. The reason um, why I got to know you was because of the water um, project, the water lingerie project. Can you tell us more about the initial idea? You just said you got hyper um, when seeing all these graphics that were not being the, the graphics you, you, you were used to. Uh, but can you tell us more about the initial idea for this project and how you translated this into a collection? Uh, yes, so yeah, I told I was turned on by the, by the graphs and by the technology. Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, I want, uh, I wanted to um, visualize that we shouldn't take our dry feet for granted, especially in the Netherlands, um, by actually showing that there, these were graphs of a really heavy rain in 2017. One from the um, Amsterdam canals, uh, the, the water levels in the Amsterdam canals, and the other from the Bosom water pump station. So that's a funny uh, <laughs> word uh, joke, you could say. 
uh, that's the lowest areas in the Netherlands where, uh, um, yeah, but it was a really heavy rain and all the water pump stations made over hours and they worked really hard to manage everything and they just worked through the night. So, uh, but you, if you just cycle through the um, streets, they, which are wet, you don't really think about that. There's lots of work that makes sure it's not one meter high. Uh, and I also didn't know how much work it was being done. Um, so that was actually the goal, the collection to make people aware of that. Well, if, if uh, sea levels are rising more, maybe the work wouldn't even be possible to, to still do because there, it's just too much. Um, yeah, so that was the, that was the actual uh, goal of that collection. Um, yeah. I think okay. that, that answered the question. Yeah, that answers the question perfectly. And, and in general, what message do you like to send to the world with your designs or with Ade van Zullet? Yeah, so what I mentioned in the beginning is that uh, we also take for granted the clothes we wear, the people that work on it and the uh, resources that are needed for it. So my main goal is to make people aware of how much effort it actually costs to create a garment uh, and you shouldn't treat it like a, like a piece of cheese of five euros that you can throw like maybe if it's not good enough you can throw away or like a, like a throwaway product and I, my, yeah, my main goal is to make people aware of that you should cherish and treat your uh, garments well um, yeah, that's the main goal. Okay, and how do you try to communicate that via design? Are there certain tips and tricks you use to get people to uh, create more a user's product bond? Um, well, yeah, one thing is also to, to have the option to make it personal for somebody. So to make, if you, the, the, the aesthetics are kind of projected onto the body, so actually, not only if you make it custom fit, it also is custom for the aesthetics. So the aesthetics change a bit on every different person. And the other one is um, yeah, to, to really um, have a layered story. First of all, I think if you want to tell stories with design, art or uh, fashion, I think first of all, it should be uh, aesthetically pleasing. Or, beautiful but beautiful is maybe uh, harder to test uh, because it tastes different but sometimes but you can sometimes agree that something is really ugly and then I don't really get the um, raison d'etre of that because if you want to tell a story it works better if it's if people are drawn to it because then they think oh that's beautiful and then they are maybe looking through the other layer of what this design has to say so that's my opinion on design and fashion that yeah beauty should not be underestimated mm -hmm. i think that's a very good tip um besides working hard to keep your practice fruitful uh, how do you create time to keep inspired and uh, keep these fresh ideas coming mm. Um, well, the task force pr project was actually, uh, yeah, I was given the opportunity to be part of that project. So that was just like a gift of inspiration. Uh, I, I feel like that. And now um, I also have a, a great passion for music. So even before the task force project, I was thinking about so doing something with music. And then I came up, I wanted to do something with a voice and then preferably a singer to also have this personal aspect. So uh, create uh, garments with the voice of a singer, uh, visualize the singer's voice into a garment so the singer can wear her own voice. Um, and with this, my new collection is about this. And um, <clears throat> uh, I also, I, I encountered Anna that's a singer and she also sings about sustainable fashion and climate change. So also for other people that are wearing her voice, they will be able to wear the message of sustainable fashion. So 
it all comes together. Uh, but for my next um, uh, collection, I don't really have an idea yet, but uh, we'll see. Okay. Um, and during your career, what important lesson did you learn or what kind of wisdom did you gain that you'd like to share with the community? Mm, well, I, uh, I have developed uh, uh, three years. I've developed my method of creating um, like a custom fit bra based on a 3D body scan, including a um, uh, replacement of the underwire that's also made completely custom. I can maybe, it's just lying here. It's this, this is the Curvaris. So it's double curved and then uh, based on your 3D body scan and 3D printed. And if you are developing, developing a new product, I would say start testing it with users if, it's, it's, if it has some functionality. But don't, uh, I was uh, yeah, kind of education, educated as a, as a scientist, kind of, in a scientist way. So uh, you have to make all circumstances the same and have enough people uh, participating in your research. So I had 30 people to test with, but I actually didn't really have that much experience making bras. So uh, if I would do it again, I would just start with five first and try to make a really good bra for them and then say, okay, this phase is over and then five more and then improve instead of trying to do them all at the same time. That's one advice I can give. Um, and another one is really listen to uh, yeah, what, what you want to achieve. Um, there were certain paths I could take to more in the startup tech uh, corner. Uh, but uh, I, I was always being strong headed there and really not wanting to do what I was told kind of. Um, because it just wasn't for me. It's just, it's a really profitable, like capitalist way of working, grow as fast as you can, and then have an exit strategy so you can cash a lot and find investors. Uh, and I was like, that was, no, that was not for me. So, but I had to find out that in uh, two or three years before I was really like, okay, I, I'm going to say goodbye to this, um, this path um, but maybe uh, if I was uh, really listening to myself I could say goodbye to that sooner mm -hmm. but who knows I'm not sure if I do it again if I would um, if I would have made different decisions <laughs> what dream do you have for the future of Ali van Twillert and for you as a designer I want yeah I want to to become a more established brand and want to set the example for um, yeah, body fashion, you call it. So everything related to closely fitted garments. Um, and I also would love it to have this underwear be one of the new standards of um, uh, in lingerie and uh, be like a pioneer in um, ultra personalized products in that sense. Um, and make this more normal. Um, so this personalization will become easier for other, for, like for consumers to accept as well. Okay. And uh, you know about CCDNL now, um, what do you think, hope that CCDNL community can help you with or can offer to you? Um, yeah, I would, I would be, for, well, I'm now working on my next, next collection, but I have no clue yet what I'm going to do after that in terms of um, yeah, the artistic development of, of uh, my brand. So um, maybe they can offer me a framework to work within, uh, to discover new technologies uh, within, this, uh, within the, the traditional techniques, for example. That would be really cool. Um, uh, yeah, to... I think that that would be really cool. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for this uh, inspiring interview and for the insights of your uh, designing technique. Um, I think the technological part um, is something you don't hear often, um, at least in the, in the field of textiles. So um, thank you for that. And um, 
yeah, hope to see you in the future. Yes, thank you for the chat. Thank you, Laura. Laura Luchtman from KUKA Design here to do this interview with us today. Um, we will talk about uh, designing techniques and how you get inspired in the first place and about having a design practice and everything that inspires you in general. Um, so I'd like to do this short interview with you. Yes. Um, well, first of all, who, who are you? I just mentioned your name and your company, but who are you and what do you do with uh, KUKA? Yes, um, I'm Laura. KUKA is a textile and surface design studio based in uh, Rotterdam. Um, I'm based in the Wasserij, which is a fashion hub here in Rotterdam. And um, I, I design prints and patterns for textiles, but also for clothing, um, wallpaper, now fashion and home goods mainly. Um, and I also do my own uh, self-initiated research. And then I really focus on experimental color research and material research. Um, I do it for clients, but I also work on my own projects. So, yeah, both. Okay, super interesting. Um, we know uh, each other via the Wasserij, but I know and I've met you before during one of the events of CCDNL. Um, well, it's interesting to know, for me at least, how did you get to know CCDNL? Um, I think it was over a year ago in May, I got an invitation of one of the interns of CCDNL for the Binding with ECOT event in May. And um, I was really interested. So I showed up to see what the event was about because I'm always fascinated by all kinds of textile techniques and craftsmanship. And um, I have always loved ECOT. So yeah, and then I went to the first meeting um, and then I also went to the second meeting, which was about Kazuri, the Japanese ikat. Uh, and then I, I think I have been to every meeting and I met you in The Hague at the embassy. Um, so yeah, yeah, and I think um, in the beginning of this year, I went to Japan and I also visited some uh, ikat or Kazuri weavers in Japan. And uh, it was right at the beginning of the COVID um pandemic here so i had to return early and um i wrote a blog about it and i sent it to yeti and uh, they asked me to do an interview about the, yeah what what the designers and the weavers in japan face now in uh, these COVID times so for the kazuri brochure so yeah that's my uh that's how i'm involved with the cc dnl okay that's quite a lot so you're already involved. Um, I did not know that you did an interview, which is super nice. You should share yeah. this blog after this webinar with the group. That would be nice to uh, reshare it so everybody can read okay. it. Yeah. Um, but um, that's, that's, of course, the, the overlapping uh, fascination for crafts and for the craft ECOT in general. But um, is there something that triggers you also about the goals of CCDNL behind this uh, fascination for uh, artistry? Yes, I really like the, the efforts in reviving the old and ancient techniques, but also preserving the, the craftsmanship and the, the heritage, which is, well, here, at least in the Netherlands, all these techniques we had, like back in the day, they all disappeared, um, mostly, and also in Western Europe. And I think in, like, Indonesia, for example, um, there are a lot more people that do still have the knowledge and do still know how to do these uh, crafts. Um, so I think it's really important that these things don't get lost and that they are preserved. Um, yeah, that's... Uh, because I'm, when I'm thinking about the Netherlands, I think some of these techniques we have here just got lost within two generations, which is crazy when you think about it. So if you're not careful, it can disappear within two generations and then all these uh, old traditions and yeah, <laughs> centuries of uh, crops and techniques are gone. You can never get it back. Not, yeah, not in the same way. So it's really important. Yeah. And do you see, do you see, um 
of course, that's something that triggers you and, and uh, do you feel it in your heart. Um, at least that's what I see with CCDNL. It's, um, you have this chance to, to act now. And maybe sometimes in the Netherlands, you already have the feeling, oh, it's, it's long lost and gone. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, more on your uh, process and more on how you get to design. I'd like to hear more about your uh, creative and creation process. Can you tell me more about it? Um, well, I always start my projects with some kind of research. It can be research into a certain topic that I don't know enough about yet, or it can be research into a client or a brand or their end user. Um, uh, so it depends. In my, in my own, own projects, I have more time to do the research part, so I will go more in depth. And uh, I really love it to yeah, get all these kinds of knowledge and read books and, and start my concept from there. So I start with the research, then I develop the concept. And the concept I'll always visualize with um, inspirational images, colors, materials, uh, motifs. Um, and then when I have this visual concept, um, I will start designing. Okay. And this, this designing, that's the creative uh, process. Um, do you have a certain method for it? How do, you, how do you get to a certain shape or combination? Yeah, um, well, I always keep like the end product that I'm designing, I always keep it in mind when I start the design process. So I always think about who is going to use it or who is going to wear it, uh, in what season, um, is it a design that will last a long, uh, long time, like many years? So it has to be kind of timeless. So I will, yeah, um, determine the shapes and colors that are not too trendy, you know, so it will last longer. Um, and I also design mostly on my computer, uh, but I also draw and design by hand and then digitalize it afterwards. But um, yeah, I think I missed working with my hands like a couple of years back when I was only working behind my computer all day. And so uh, now I start to work with my hands more and do some little prototypes with my hands, like little weaves or uh, um, yeah, and drawing by hand as well. Just to get this creation back in this tactility and inspiration yes. material. Yeah. Yeah. I really miss the tactility part. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in textile. It's a very important part. Yes, it is. Yeah. You uh, said before in answer to your previous question that you already in the mood board phase or in the inspirational phase, you choose on a certain set of colors. Um, how do you get to choose a certain amount, a certain color scheme? I'm asking this question because uh, we have the discussion within CCD now with the artisans between using natural colors and artificial colors and colors of the season or timeless colors. Is that something you are aware of and how do you choose it? Yes, I, yeah, what, what I also said with um, how I started design process, the same I do with color. So I'm already thinking about what am I going to create? What kind of product is it? Um, sometimes I don't know when I'm um, designing textiles for uh, textile manufacturers, I don't really know the end product that I'm going to make with the textile. So that's a little different. Um, but I also always try to see what the, yeah, the, what the function is. So um, that's how I determine colors by looking at seasons, um if if it has to be trendy what the the age group is or what kind of culture or even skin tone or um but it's also re very intuitional or um what's the word it is all also a very intuitive process yeah yeah and, and so i think i also choose colors part of my personal preferences which also change throughout the years um, yeah, yeah. Uh, two questions on that. You talk about seasonal um, 
or, or trendy colors, is there a magazine or a, a, a trend forecast that you'd like to follow for the color design or the upcoming uh, colors for the next year? Yeah, there are several. Um, I always look at the Pantone, of course, which is the color standard I use a lot. Um, they also have these uh, seasonal and yearly color trends. Um, I look at Lansing, which is um, a textile yarn uh, uh, manufacturer. They have really beautiful color prognosis um, and the WGSN, that kind of um, trend forecasting platforms. Um, so when I really have to work with trendy colors, then I use these kinds of platforms to see what the latest trends are. And then I make my own color combinations and my own palettes based on those trends. And I can imagine that that totally depends on when you're working uh, for a client who already has a certain client group or uh, trend forecast that they like to follow um, in yes. comparison to self-initiated projects. Yeah, because you're talking about this intuitive process. Uh, can you try to explain the feeling behind this? Because uh, for, for a designer, being intuitive can be something totally logical. But for outsiders, this sounds like um, <laughs> something uh, very conceptual. Can you try to, uh, to put a name to it? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think everyone has, has an intuition, I think. But um, as a designer, I think it's a, in some way it's a feeling. Uh, I think it's a, just a thing you develop throughout the years when you're working with all kinds of textiles, colors, trends, clients, um, pro projects, products. Uh, but it's also kind of a voice in my head that guides me. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, if I'm like having a discussion with myself or something. So on one hand, it's a feeling. On the other hand, it's sort of a voice. Um, but I, yeah, it's also, I think the voice is kind of guiding me and telling me what the right choice is. But it's based on like the, 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 the client, the, the trends, the use, but also my own preferences and my, my gut feeling, basically, mm -hmm. so it comes together. Yeah, clear? Yeah, for me clear. Thanks for <laughs> trying to explain further. Um, I was wondering, there are, of course, way more designers in this world and um, there are multiple designing methods and we're just discussing your method today. But I was wondering what makes, uh, what makes it special, Laura Luchman's method or what is, uh, what is your technique or your signature? Yeah, it's always very hard to say that about yourself. You yeah, know? it's not easy, I know. It's the hardest question, yeah. But um, I think... Because I like concept development so much that I always have these well thought out concepts um, and, and like layers within a design or a concept or a trend or whatever. Um, and I really like that designers can uh, solve problems in a creative way. So I'm always looking at what, what are the problems my client faces or that I've noticed in society or in the industry. Um, and I try to find a creative way to solve that problem. And I think what also distinguishes me from yeah, may, maybe other designers or other practices or the industry in general is that I have a long-term view. On one hand, I work with these short-term trends, but I always try to see what will the implications be in the future. So I'm very future-focused, I think. Yeah, that's very good and very... Um, I think also uh, going on the, uh, the trend now, because I see a lot of designers changing from um, um, mass production to more made to measure, more timeless designs. Um, I think it's a, a very good vision to, uh, to go on. Yeah, that's also the reason why I have future heritage, of course. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's a good one. And you describe this uniqueness. Is that something why clients also find you? Or is there a difference between the, the uniqueness you present for your clients in comparison to the unique you, you define for your self-initiated projects? Yes. Um, I think 
my clients hire me for all kinds of different reasons. Um, it can be my, my fresh color palettes that I use for swimwear mostly, you know. Um, but um, yeah, there's certainly a difference between my self-initiated uh, projects and my client work. But I think the concept part in combination with my design style, I think that is what brings them to me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to know more about uh, one of your initiate, self initiated projects in particular. Um, that's the reason why Esther from the Wasserij originally connected us together, because you did this amazing project with bacterial uh, dyes and natural dyes. And I'd like to hear all the, all the aspects of this project. So how did you get to this idea? How did the process go? Um, everything. Please enlighten us. Yes. So I'm doing, I think for three years now, I'm researching how to dye textiles in hopefully a more sustainable way by using bacteria that produce pigments. And um, these bacteria just live in the soil uh, uh, near the roots of plants or in some live on your skin. Um, and so these bacteria, when you grow them in large colonies, so you can see them with the naked eye because normally you cannot see them. And then they start producing colors and um, it's not really known yet why they produce those colors, but scientists think it's because they, uh, the pigments help them protect each other from UV light or from other microorganisms because the pigments have an antimicrobial qualities in them. Um, and I got to know this, yeah, these bacterial pigments at a course in 2006 at the uh, Waag Society in Amsterdam. It was called Textile Academy and um, one of the workshops was bacterial pigments. And I was so fascinated by it because I'm always very fascinated by micro, uh, by the micro world, you know, the things you cannot see with the naked eye. And when you put something under a microscope or a whole new world, um, yeah, you, can, you see a whole new world. So uh, that was always super fascinating for me. And, and because I'm a print and pattern designer, I, there are mainly three things that I can control within my designs or crafts. It's color, shape, and uh, material. And um, I was always thinking about the, yeah, the, the pollution, uh, which is a very big problem in the textile industry. And um, I want to contribute something positive to that problem. So that's why I, I was very fascinated by these um, bacterial pigments because when you grow them, you don't need any kind of uh, toxic chemicals to grow them and also not to dye the fabric because what we do is we, we have uh, these bacteria, we grow them in, a, in a, a nutrient, which is a kind of a broth, of, is, a, is a liquid. Um, and then we add textile and then we place the bacteria on the textile and then we leave them for three days. And within three days, the bacteria start multiplying and they start producing the pigment. And the pigment really uh, attaches at the same time to the textile. So after three days, you have a colored textile, which is really amazing. Um, yeah, so, and we don't use any high dying temperatures. For example, we don't use a lot of water so that, those are really um, good qualities of this dyeing process, which is hopefully more sustainable, even if you could scale it, because now it's all in a small laboratory, and small, um, on a small scale. So uh, the scaling part is a big uh, challenge still. That's yeah. the bottleneck for now. Yeah, it is. I have some, um, some examples from the bacteria dyes. These are like fabric swatches. Uh, this is a dyed silk and hemp blend, um, dyed with yeah, bacteria that have produce a purple, or purple pigment. <laughs> um, we also have another type of bacteria that produces a red pigment, and when you dye textiles with it, you end up with these like pinkish, different kinds of shades of pink. This is on silk. Can see it. 
So, and what I also like about these bacterial colors is that they don't really look like natural colors. When you see them, they could also look like synthetic colors. So I think that's also a big advantage. And we can dye synthetic fabrics, synthetic brands. So that's also that a great advantage because the synthetic yes. dyeing process can be so chemical and so hurtful for the environment. Yeah, it is by bacteria. It's it's great. You just mentioned about this project that that it's still in a scale up phase and that the bottleneck is to scale up. But at the same time, I've read more about your project. Uh, you've already got some worldwide recognition with this small project you call it yourself. Uh, can you tell us more about this? Um, yeah, the success with the project. Yeah, when I started the project, of course, I had no clue it would like end up like this. But um, I started the project because, as an individual designer, I wanted to collaborate. Of, I wanted to contribute something positive to the industry and want to create change from within. But of course, as an individual, you can feel really overwhelmed by all the problems there are, and it's impossible to solve those by yourself. But I think what this project really did for me and what it shows is that this is a project that I started with the other designer. We are just the two of us. And um, this project really gave us a worldwide stage to talk about the issues, to offer possible solutions and to create a mindset change in people and to inform them to make more conscious choices. So um, we've exhibited around the world um, we've also had press from all kinds of um, media from around the world. And um, I think that way we also uh, got approached by the worldwide known brand Puma, the sportswear brand, that we um, developed a, yeah, a proof of concept, like a small collection this year. So we designed and created a sportswear uh, collection for them, which is the first bacterial dyed sportswear collection in the world, which is really exciting. Um, it's not for sale, it's not commercial yet because we cannot do it on a large scale, but this really shows that this bio design and this designing with bacteria has potential and it's not a utopian concept. Yeah, yeah I think it's a very good message when a, co a big company like, for example, Puma, recognizes what is happening, recognizes the potential of it, and also uh, takes the step to put trust in you guys to put only this concept collection already there instead of having this commercial thing there. Do you think that if it's, if it's scalable, um, that you will collaborate uh, in the future? Is that a possibility? Yes, yes, certainly. We are trying to find ways to scale it, not by doing everything ourselves, but also by collaborating with other startups that are doing the scaling part. So, um, yeah, it would be really great to have a collection that can actually be sold. Yeah, but I do really want to stress that it's not going to be a collection for mass production because then it wouldn't make sense, you know. So we want to sell every piece we create. We don't want to waste anything. So that's, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's going on on your uh, basic idea on production in, in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good that you honor that. You uh, speak about uh, collaboration in this project, um, and you speak about collaboration with startups. Is collaboration with other si other designers um, something you do regularly, or uh, regularly, or something that you like to do with uh, projects? Um, now, mostly I work by myself. Um, this project, I've been collaborating with uh, the other designer, Ilfa, for three years now. So that's um, quite unusual for me, I think. Um, and uh, mostly I collaborate with other disciplines. So not with other designers, but other disciplines like stylists, photographers, scientists. Um, yeah, that's mostly the people I collaborate with. But I'm always open to collaborate with anyone. But, but Collaborating with the other designer, I have to make sure that we are not doing the same thing, you know. I always try to find people with uh, other skills or other um, networks or, um, yeah, so you can really complement each other, but we have to have the same vision. That's important. 
And you also have to be a nice person to work with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, very important. <laughs> yeah, you already uh, stole my next question about what kind of skills you, you seek when you're looking for collaborations, but you already answered that. Um, I think it's very good to look at, at um, yeah, skills and, and perspectives that are not your own, but can be uh, uh, additional to your own practice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and besides working hard to keep uh, KUKA fruitful, uh, how do you create time to get inspired and keep inspired and get fresh, uh, fresh ideas? Um, well, my inspiration really comes from everywhere, but I draw a lot of inspiration from nature and also from art. So what I like to do in my spare time, or also sometimes in my work time, is go visit an exhibition, a museum. Um, and I also really like to do nothing, you know, like clear my head, go to the beach, take a long walk, because I think the best ideas always come to me when I'm doing a kind of routine task, like doing the dishes or cleaning or, or taking a shower. Um, so, yeah, I think moments when I'm not really thinking about anything particular, like taking a walk or doing these routine tasks, that is when my best ideas come. And I, of course, they have been brewing and for a long time, probably, because all the input I had during the days that I'm working. But um, yeah, that's when they pop up. <laughs> okay, good tip, good tip. Um, and then for, for tips, is there an important lesson you learned in all those years you, you have your own practice that you like to share with the community? Lots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. When you start out as an entrepreneur, I, I mean, I had no idea where to start when I began. I just began and I thought, well, and now? <laughs> I had a website and nothing happened. And it was totally naive uh, concept. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm um, self-employed now for 10 years. I'm, yeah, and I'm in the studio for 10 years now, so I've learned uh, quite some things through the years. Um, I think my main advice is always to listen to your gut. That is the, the intuition again, because I try to ignore that voice in my head and that feeling with some projects I, I accepted or started on. And, um, and there, there were some warning signs which I ignored. And afterwards, when I look back, I should have start, known it or, or, yeah, stopped it at the beginning. I should have just said no, you know. So now I try to really listen to my gut feeling and when I make choices. So, of course, also rationally, but I think my intuition is a very big part of it. Um, I don't want to work on projects or engage with people that don't have your best interest at heart or or you're just not a match, that's also possible. Um, but by saying no to things, I also think you ha don't have to shy away from um, difficult uh, things that you find scary or you really have to like push your boundaries a bit and get out of your comfort zone because um, a couple of years I was asked to do a first lecture uh, and I, haven't done it since graduating, I think. And it really scared the hell out of me. <laughs> um, but I was so flattered that they asked me that I said, well, let's do it. And I think I didn't sleep for four weeks <laughs> because I was so nervous. <laughs> uh, but then again, two years later, I did a TED talk. So, you know, yeah. Super. So also say yes to things you're really afraid of. Um, as long as your intuition uh, and gut feeling says yes. Um, yeah, and also think grow slow. Don't try to grow too fast. Um, and um, yeah, never stop. Why grow slow and not too fast? Mm, I think when you grow slow, you have a steady base. And um, also, I think you can navigate with all the changes within yourself and the economy and the industry everything yeah 
So you have time to get into pace with the things that are happening and feel secure with the things you're doing. So you have a... Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and you can also pivot to the other side when things are not working, you know? So, yeah. That's okay. Uh, my advice. <laughs> Those are very good advice. <laughs> I have plenty more, but I won't bore you with that. <laughs> oh, we, we will organize another one. It's no problem. <laughs> Um, last the question, uh, what dream do you have for your company and maybe what dream, maybe it's the same, maybe it's another, what dream do you have that the CCDNL and ECOT community can help you to achieve? Well, my dream is quite big, um, not f just for my comf company, but even bigger for the industry, for the textile and fashion industry itself. Um, my dream is to have an industry that is um, eco-friendly not polluting and also not exploiting and I think that's my biggest dream and that's what I work towards yeah so I really want to work with nature and not against it and work with people and not exploit them so that's the main uh, focus and the main goal in my design practice and for the industry that yeah. those are my hopes and I think with CCDNL, um, I think designers and artisans can really make some lasting changes in this way. Um, and by like preserving this heritage, but also creating new traditions and new symbols, new symbolism and a new design language that is future proof can really help in this. Yeah. And maybe, yeah, that's maybe another subject, but when you talk about um, the projects that CCDNL does with Japan and with Indonesia, those are, of course, two countries we have a long relationship with, with the trade history, but also the colonial history. So maybe by working together, by creating ECOTs together, perhaps by Dutch designers and Indonesian designers and makers, we can maybe even process the colonial history by developing new symbols and new traditions. Yeah, and take a step forward in some more bright future and some, yeah. yeah in a really even and, and honest collaborative way. Yeah. yeah. Well, that sounds like super ideas and super hopes. And um, I really want to thank you for this interview and this insight. I found it very Me interesting too. to get a, small grasp of your design field and your view on things and your hopes for the future and i find especially inspiring how something starting so small with a big hope as an individual can grow to something so big um, just because you're inspired or have an idea and uh, yeah talk talk the right language and people recognize it and um, thank you for this interview Thank you too. And I hope to uh, talk to you later and keep in touch. Yes. Uh, see you later in the after talk. Yeah. For questions and answers. Of yes. Looking Thanks. Forward. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Julita Otoyo. I am a lecturer and PhD candidate from the University of Bonn in Germany. My dissertation is about Indonesian traditional ikat from the perspective of art historical and design. Today, I would like to share with you the profile of the three artisans in NTT that we collaborate with. First is Alfiana Boydao. She is an artisan from Belu. In 2017, she established a group of weavers called Wahor Hadomi. She used natural dyes in making the ikats and also trained other artisans in doing the ikat with the natural dyes. She has attended exhibitions in Indonesia, in Jakarta, as well as in the Netherlands. Through our donations, last month CCDNL gave a donation to Wahor Hadomi Group in the format of yarn so they will be able to produce another ikat and keep the tradition alive and we also help them during pandemic situation second artisan that i would like to introduce today is marsa fatu and asmawet fatu they are ikat artisans from rotenau 
and they are specialized in weaving rotating dough ikat motifs. They are also designing clothes using that motifs. She uses both natural and non-natural dyes, and Marsha designs a variety of fashion clothes using traditional rotating dough ikat. Asmawet weaves the original rotating dough ikat. The third artisan is Mrs. Shari Atore. She is an ikat artisan from Alor who is expert on natural dyes ikat in NTT. She has created more than 300 natural dyes and established an ikat group in NTT called Kampung Patola, which consists of 75 members. And also she is now active to train others uh, ikat weavers using natural dyes around NTT. Now we will listen the interviews that are being made by our team with the artisans. Enjoy. What makes the usage of natural dyes vital for you and what message do you like to tell the world by using them? Saya memilih bahan alami karena bahan-bahan alami nyaman saat dipakai dan hemat biayanya. How do you choose colors for your designs? Is this depending on the mood or the moment or does it correlate to a particular design motif or pattern? Untuk motif dan warna tergantung selera atau minat pemesan. Misalnya, ujung tombak atau cumen disusun sesuai tahapan-tahapannya lalu diikat kemudian diwarnai. Asmawet, who taught you in the art of weaving? Menjadi penenun mulai dari usia 13 tahun sampai sekarang. Dan tenun yang saya hasilkan setiap bulan berupa sarung, selendang, dan selimut. Dan hasil tenunan saya dijual sendiri di rumah. Dan ada juga pesanan dari kantor-kantor dan uangnya untuk kebutuhan sehari-hari. And Marsa, who taught you being a fashion designer? Saya mulai belajar mendesain baju tenun ikat sejak usia 25 tahun. Saya tertarik mendesain baju tenun karena hobi dan saya menggunakan tenun karena ingin memperkenalkan kain tenun adat rote ke dunia luar. Yang menginspirasi saya, pakaian batik bisa dikenal sampai luar negeri, pastinya kain tenun rote juga bisa. Pelajaran yang saya dapatkan selama membuat baju tenun bisa mengenal lebih banyak orang. Harapan saya, baju-baju yang saya buat bisa dipakai oleh kalangan yang lebih luas. Dan CCDNL bisa membantu memperkenalkan ke dunia luar. Syariat, what inspires you most about ikat? Tenun ikat karena mungkin itu kebudayaan juga. Kebudayaan, kawin mengawin, semua itu dari tenun. Makanya saya juga harus ambil tenun. Can you tell us an important lesson or wisdom that you learned during your career that you like to share with us? Usia tujuh tahun sudah tenun, dan yang mengajari itu ibu saya. Mungkin yang sembilan warna yang ibu ajari, yang saya uji coba itu sudah menjadi 214. Juga makan saya rujuk itu untuk warna alam karena Saya usia 6 tahun 2 bulan, Bapak sudah almarhum. Saya hidup berdua mama dan saya bekerja dengan mama hanya tenun ikat dan pewarna alam. Do you weave precisely the same as your predecessors or did you develop a personal distinction that is visible in your weaves or in your technique? Tenun Adat, berarti itu khusus adat itu tidak boleh rombak. Tapi kalau untuk pesanan, berarti kita kombinasi warna, kombinasi motif, itu hanya kombinasi. Tapi untuk suku-suku itu tidak bisa. Syariat, what dream do you have and how can the CCDNL community and ICAT community help you to achieve this? Kalau untuk harapan saya itu, uh, 
untuk yang kita bisa hadapi hadapi ini dan uh, tolong sampaikan ke media sosial bisa bantu kami untuk anak-anak ke depan kesulitan anak kuliah anak ya anak sekolah bisa bantu kami untuk uh, uh, buka buka usaha untuk kami di luar negeri that brings us to the end of this webinar so many designers so many ways to create designs We've taken a look at the most commonly used methods and inspirations. How cultural heritage, for example, visible in the ritual weaves of Shariat, plays a vital role in the inspiration and creation of Ikat weaves in Entity. We've heard how something that started small could become of significant influence with the Living Color project of Laura Luchman. And how design does not only cover being created, but can also combine other disciplines like science through the process of Liedewey van Twiller. And importantly, we've seen how all interviewed designers feel the urge to reach a broad public with their works. I hope that this webinar gave inspiration for participating designers and artisans to widen their scope to various design approaches. But to all people participating in this webinar, I ask them to help spread the word on fantastic designs that are being created by designers like Selfie, Asmawet, Marsa, Shariat, uh, Laura and Liedewey. And of course, other designers that you have and find in your surroundings. Design can be innovative, of influence and of cultural importance. So let us collaborate to raise awareness of its power. Thank you. So we hope today's webinar will bring us together more understanding in the design method, working from the personal fascination. I would like also to invite you to join our further programs. We have giving away a beautiful ikat face mask. This is as a gift of donation. Please follow our social media and visit www.gift.nl. And also for Indonesia, please follow ikat.nl and also for funding through kitabisa.com second since ccdnl also working with japanese ikat kasuri so we will also have webinars coming in november 2020 it will be also followed by another series of webinar from indian ikat will start in december 2020 of course, there is one more important event that we will have is the third webinar from Nikki Westers that will be presented in January 2021. So please mark your calendars and follow our social media for further information. Now we are at the end of our event. On behalf of the directors and the whole team of CCDNL, I would like to thank you to all of you who is participating today. Special thanks to our speaker today, Nikki Wester, Richard Heritage Designer, Yeti van der Maade Hanning, Director from CCDNL, Esther Munoz Gratveld, Program Manager, The Wasserai Rotterdam, Laura Luchman, Textile and Surface Designer, Ledewees van Twillert, Fashion Engineer, Artisan from Indonesia, Selfiana Boydow, Masa Fatu, Asma Wet Fatu, and Syariat Tole. The dancer from Wahana Budaya Nusantara Dance Group, and Nisita Mirella for all your continued support. And our donators who make this event possible, donators from our crowdfunding, donator Mrs. Rahma Salo, and Picto Right Fund. Of course, thank you so much to CCDNL team, volunteers and interns who work hard in organizing this event. And I would like to invite you to join the Zoom meeting will be held next after this. You have the possibilities to ask questions and discussions with our speakers live from all around the world. So see you then. Thank you.